Dr. Russell Norman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise on behalf of the Green Party to speak to the Financial Markets Conduct Bill. Um, there's a lot in this bill, uh, and it has uh, perhaps another po uh, a number of points of departure, but clearly one of the essential ones is the failure of the finance companies. Um, and the failure of the finance companies really uh, stands behind uh, this bill, uh, though it's, it's about more than that. I think it's important uh, for us to remind ourselves of the scale. Uh, there were about 67 finance companies that ended up in the deep freeze. Um, some of them got out again, but not very many. Um, there was about $9 billion worth of deposits that was put at risk as a result. Uh, there were about 242,000 or about a quarter of a million New Zealand investors um, whose deposits were threatened as a result of the failure of the finance companies. Some of these investors got all their money back, uh, some of them got some of them back and some of them didn't get much back at all. So these finance companies which proliferated um, <clears throat> in an unregulated environment uh, caused tremendous damage to the New Zealand economy and caused tremendous damage to those individuals. On top of that, uh, after the GFC, the global financial crisis, the taxpayer um, got involved in this as well and with the deposit guarantee ended up losing hundreds of millions of dollars probably, um, we haven't got the final number, um, hundreds of millions of dollars through the deposit guarantee scheme, particularly associated with South Canterbury Finance. Essentially. Uh, in some respects, you could argue um, that the disaster of the finance companies was a failure of the Clark Cullen government to regulate the sector. Um, we saw the sector emerging um, through the early 2000s and a completely unregulated sector and clearly in need of regulation. Um, but I think it's probably fair to say that the Clark Cullen government wasn't willing to challenge many of the uh, fundamentals of the neoliberal economic order and simply let the finance sector get out of control. Um, you could say the same thing about the housing market. Um, I would note that the current Labor Party has learned the lesson of the GFC, which I think is great. It's a pity that Clark and Cullen hadn't learned it earlier or we could have avoided the disaster that became the finance companies. On top of that, we had the South Canterbury Finance bailout debacle. Um, essentially, this was uh, the fault of the current government, essentially. Um, when uh, those people who were close to the scene understood what was going on, they realised that South Canterbury Finance was still making dodgy loans and still providing very high rates of return and was entirely government guaranteed. Um, and so they rushed to put their money into South Canterbury Finance uh, to get the high interest payments that were being paid there that were entirely government guaranteed. And unfortunately, the finance minister at the time didn't intervene to close down deposits into South Canterbury Finance, which is clearly what needed to happen. And so the taxpayer um, ended up paying far more in terms of the bailout there than they needed to. The, the question, I guess, that needs to be asked in relation to the finance companies then is, does the bill before us make it harder to make those responsible um, for things like um, the finance company collapse, does it make it harder or easier to keep those people accountable for their actions? <coughs> Pardon me, Mr Speaker. I think that's one of the key questions um, that we need to face. And if we're going to answer the question of does this bill make it easier or harder, we need to look at what was the existing situation. And in this regard, um, there's many points of departure, but you could look at the serious fraud office investigation into Hanover, um, which was one of the companies. Um, serious Fraud Office investigated Heno Hanover, I think it was over 32 months. It was a, a massive investigation, 100,000 pages of evidence. Um, and at the end of the day, they came to the, to the conclusion that they couldn't prosecute. Um, this was in spite of what the, the, the other conclusions they came to. And I, I want to read from um, the Serious Fraud Office statement of April this year about the Hanover investigation. They said that the SFO believes that serious questions arise as to the consistency between the overall view of the nature and financial condition of the companies disclosed to investors in the period from December 2007 and the actual position of the company. So what Hanover told the market and what was the reality of the market. They said the solvency of the companies at the time that dividends were paid during the six months immediately prior to the suspension of payments to depositors in July 2008. So were these companies solvent? The propriety of a number of transactions entered into in the three months immediately prior to the suspension of payments to depositors that appear to have provided little or no benefit to the companies while conferring some significant benefits on to related parties. 
this is, of course, the problem where related parties can benefit um, at the expense of the everyday depositor who ends up losing money. And fourthly, the accuracy of the valuation of the company's assets in the financial statements supporting the debt repayment proposal put to investors in November 2008. Of course, the accuracy of a statement with regard to a company's assets is one of the key responsibilities of a director um, of one of these companies. And so for the serious fraud office to say it has serious questions about it um, is significant. <coughs> so those were the, the questions that the SFO asked um, and believed that it had serious uh, concerns about. However, they went on to say, however, in order for criminal charges to be successful, it is necessary not only to prove beyond reasonable doubt that these circumstances occurred and that they breached the company's legal obligations, but that identified individuals in control of the companies had both knowledge of the circumstances and caused them to occur with dishonest intent. Recent decisions relating to other failed finance companies have highlighted how difficult it is to satisfy this demand, said Simon McCarley. The reason why this is significant is that was the situation under existing law before this bill, the Financial Markets Conduct Bill, appeared. And under the existing law, what the SFO was saying was that it was pretty difficult um, to get prosecutions under the existing law. Um, and then they go on to talk about the Solicitor General's prosecution guidelines, which led to them to the conclusion that it was highly unlikely they would get a successful prosecution um, with regard to the Hanover case. The reason why this is important is we need to ask ourselves, is the new law that is very likely to be um, put into um, pass tonight on its third reading, will the new law make it easier or harder for those responsible for these kinds of activities to be prosecuted or not? And I think what's pretty clear is that it will make it harder to get a criminal conviction as a result of the new law. And for those quarter of a million New Zealanders who lost money in the finance company disaster, it is highly significant that the Parliament will be passing laws that make it harder to get a criminal conviction under this new law in a similar circumstance than the old law. And I think that those quarter of a million New Zealanders who lost money um, in the finance companies would be surprised to learn that it is the intent of the Parliament uh, to pass a law to make it harder to get a criminal um, prosecution over the line um, under the new law, and I think I find it surprising as well. Um, under the new bill, uh, essentially there's a separate criminal liability um, for a director, so there is, there is an element of criminal liability possible, and that's where there is a disclosure defect, as it's called, like a false statement um, in a prospectus, for example, that is materially adverse from the investor's point of view. So if there's a false statement made in a prospectus which has a negative consequence for investors, um, then there is the possibility of criminal liability for the director of such a company. The offence would be committed if the offer took place with the director's authority, permission or consent, and the director knew of, or was reckless as to whether there was a defect. Um, so that's the criminal provision. Basically, the Crown would have to prove a guilty mind in order to get a successful prosecution. I think it's pretty clear that under the new bill, it'll be harder to get a prosecution than under the old bill, to get a, a prosecution over the line and a conviction than under the old bill. And I think for the nearly quarter of a million New Zealanders who were stung by the finance companies, they'll be surprised by that. Um, essentially, what's clear is that under the new bill, the primary remedy for wrongdoing um, for things like inadequate disclosure is the civil regime rather than the criminal one. And so that's civil claims for cash. But even there, there are some pretty strong defences that directors will have if any civil proceedings are made against them. Um, <clears throat> uh, so it's not at all clear to me that this bill progresses the plight of those 250,000 investors um, in terms of whether those who commit these acts uh, such as misleading investors, uh, whether those people will be more uh, liable for a criminal offence. I think it's clear they won't be. It'll be harder to get a criminal prosecution. But even a civil uh, a penalty, a cash penalty, um, will have its challenges as well. So for those people, I think they will be scratching their heads as to why this parliament will be passing this bill tonight. I would also make the point, uh, as David Parker did, that whether this will actually make it easier for smaller companies to access capital to grow, I think is a very valid point, and it's very hard to see that it will, but maybe it will. I could be proved wrong.
Um, <clears throat> Mr Speaker, because of that particular problem with the bill, even though there are elements of it that we support, and we do support significant elements of it, um, because of that problem with the bill, we won't be supporting it at this time. We get proved wrong, um, and that the bill actually turns out to have more positive effects. But we shall see. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Call for Senator Sam Lutowinger. Mr Speaker, it's a, it's a pleasure to speak on this.